need your help. Okay. Uh, to pronounce it, your name. Liaru. Again? Liaru. Liaru. Fair enough. <laughs> And we're back. <laughs> that was kind of scaring. Uh, so I really had no idea that there are dragons in technology. <laughs> Everywhere. I believe that Frank Liaru uh, will explain further about that. Yes, I will me. be talking about dragons. <laughs> okay. So, um, I'm not really just talking about dragons, I'm also going to talk about, um, about Mars. This is specifically about colonizing Mars, living on Mars, so, um, and about what uh, things that will, uh, challenges that will bring. I'm, don't, I'm not really into spacefaring, so I don't really know anything about that, so I'll ignore some of the difficult details. But suppose you're on Mars, right? And you're on Mars and you're hungry, and unlike this guy, you don't want potatoes, you want a pizza. So, you want to order a pizza, right? So, so you start up your space Firefox, and you type in uh, a place that delivers out there, and you press enter, and you know what happens then? Well, absolutely nothing, exactly, exactly because um, light speed is not a, it's not a joke. It, it, makes, it makes a difference. And for, uh, for a place like Mars, getting to Earth for a light takes between 8 and 24 minutes. That's one way. So a round trip, let's for now call it 30 minutes. So that's, that's not nothing. Um, so if we go back to our browser, um, what does a browser do? Well, first of all, it will do a DNS lookup usually. So the DNS lookup goes on its way to Earth. The re result comes back, and an hour later, you have an IP number. So then, usually, most pizza places I've done research, they do a redirect. So that redirect request goes on its way to Earth, comes back, another hour gone. Uh, then it starts to actually get some HTML. So another hour. And then it needs some CSS and images and stuff. Another hour. And the CSS probably needs more images or uh, JavaScript, so now we're down to like, like several hours for the first page. And I did some more research for, uh, for, uh, for ordering a pizza. Usually, it will take about eight pages to get to the pizza, and that's without uh, specifying the toppings and the crust. So, so th Looking at this, it, it's a lot between like 15 and 20 hours to order the pizza. So it's no surprise that um, for this, um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Internet is pretty broken for interplanetary communication. So even if we d ignore all the silly things of actually getting a pizza to Mars because it, nobody will d deliver there, it will cost about two billion a pizza in in shipping costs, it will take you about uh, one or two years. <laughs> so that, that's not gonna that's not gonna work, and our space traveler is not happy. But let's get back to Earth because now we are just talking silly things. But on Earth, we we do things, and let, let's take a thread, a thread in a Java environment. The thread is in a JVM, it's on a machine, it's in a data center somewhere, and, it, and, and let's, let's, this thread, let's call him Bob, because of the thread. I try to get a connection to that thread. And, and Bob has a job to do. Bob has to execute, uh, has to execute a method. Yeah, so for example, uh, it needs to do something with GitHub, and it does, connects there, and it uh, send some data and it gets some token back. Nothing fancy. But if we're going to break down what that exactly will do, it, it will, it's pretty much the same deal as the Firefox browser on Mars. It will do a connect, it will connect with TCP. I kind of, I will ignore the DNS stuff for now, but it will connect, then it will wait until the connection is there. One round trip. 
encryption, HTTPS, you gotta be safe. I ignore that for the Mars one, but still, it's there. Uh, two round trips even. Uh, it needs to push the request, right? Then it waits again. And finally, some data starts coming in. But in the end, that's quite a few round trips. And uh, even if you get the data at once, that's a, that's a, that takes a lot of time. Because, and that, that makes bad Bob really sad. Because Bob is there waiting and waiting and waiting. And like a, a normal web service call takes maybe a blink of an eye, like 100 milliseconds is not ridiculous. It could be better, but for, for argument's sake, let's take 100 milliseconds. For a threat, that is a lot. Actually, for a threat, I would argue that it's pretty much as bad, right? So, um, because if we talk about time in computing, if we talk about network latency, we talk in milliseconds. If we talk about application instructions, we talk in microseconds. If we talk in actual hardware, we talk in nanoseconds. And for us humans, we can reason about it, but we can't feel it. Nobody knows what a nanosecond feels like. Like a few, a few dozen milliseconds is like the smallest thing you can uh, experience. And that makes it very hard to, to actually feel how long that is if you, if you look for, for a thread. So uh, if it does this, it spends so much time waiting. And that I argue doing a, a blocking call remote is pretty much like ordering a pizza from Mars. Yeah, so it, 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 it's really a very inefficient way of doing business. And also, it's just wrong. It, it, it's just, you have to think of Bob. Bob does his best, but he doesn't want to waste his time, so we should free Bob. <laughs> and so that Bob can do useful things in its time, and it doesn't need to sit, sit around waiting. So that brings us to here. Um, my name is Frank Leroux. I'm a CTO at a small company in Amsterdam. And uh, I'm going to do some basics uh, in non-blocking code in RxJava. Just a show of hands, who has used RxJava before? Uh -huh. And uh, who has used uh, non-blocking code? <laughs> good, good, good. So this is a, this is a online example. And this is, uh, you can try it yourself if you want. And this does a, a, a connection, it makes connection to eBay and it, do, it does a search. It searches for a kayak. And you can do, if you do the blocking one, you see it, it took like 300 milliseconds, pretty slow, but still. Uh, and it gets some result. Like, but in the, it also does an asynchronous one. It's, it's somehow a little bit, oh, there, there. Somehow it's a, it's, a, it's a little bit faster, but you can see that the red part is the part where the, where the threat was actually doing it something. Hmm. My laser doesn't work. Okay, no lasers for me. So the, the, the green part is when the threat is just sitting around doing absolutely nothing. Yeah, so actually from the nearly 300 milliseconds, it's actually working for half a millisecond. So we are having like a 0.1 or 2% utilization here, which is wrong. So uh, I will quickly go through the, what non-blocking code is. I mean, most of you have heard about it, so I'll go fast. So blocking code, the basic things. It's very, very basic. So what you do with blocking code is you call a method, then you do a semicolon because Java likes it, and then you do another method, and it finish the first one first, and then it does the second one, and then it does the third one, etc. It's really easy to talk about. But, um, uh, yeah, it, it's easy to compose, because we can use the semicolon, we can reason about it, it's easy to debug, because if we were not sure, we can put a breakpoint somewhere, and then we check the state at that moment, if it is like what we expect. Um, it maps nicely to uh, processor instructions. It's pretty efficient. It's very, very mature. And it's familiar. And as if you're like me, who has been programming since the 80s on a Commodore 64, it is really nice to do something you have been doing for such a long time. You, you get familiar with it. So it's actually pretty good blocking code. So why would you want to mess with it? 
Well, so let, if we talk about blocking code, um, for example, uh, uh, what a non-blocking code will do is that when you call a non-blocking piece of code, it will return straight away, even if it's not really finished. So if you ask, write this down, and the return will be, yeah, I'm on it, but it doesn't really say if it's really done. Uh, so that in itself is nice, but uh, if it returns without an error, that doesn't mean anything, because the error might just simply not be there yet. But it might fail in the future. It might succeed in the future. It might be complete silence until the end of time. So you have to deal with that. Uh, so you need to know when is it done? When, when is my operation done? Uh, we need to know it, if it worked or if it failed. And often, if, especially if you're reading, for example, you want the actual result. So, and, and, then, and, then, and finally, uh, an interesting one, especially when you're writing, then you need to know if you call a write, a non-blocking write, you, can you call it straight away again after it? And again and again and a million times? Will that be all right? Will something drown down the line or not? That's something you need to know. So uh, for that, we have like the beautiful, beautiful callbacks. So you pass something to a method that will specify what it should do with the result and if it failed or, is, or if it succeeded. That's like basic stuff. But then once it starts to get more and more instructions and you specify in, you put the callback into the callback into the callback, you get JavaScript, basically. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you get the infinite pyramid of doom. Like, at some point, your code's all the way to the right, and that makes nobody happy. So why are we still writing blocking code? Well, blocking code works actually pretty well in traditional applications, in monolith, when, when the code is Near, nearby each other, it's not spread out, it works pretty well. And CPU and memory is cheap nowadays, so up and often we think like, well, it's so cheap, we just pay Amazon a little bit more, and we spin up some more threads, and we're in business. And that networks are fast, and they are, but we'll get back to that in a bit. But the most important one that keeping us on blocking code is that making non-blocking code is just not easy. It really isn't. So uh, I want to uh, go through an example. Um, who of you has used the Surflet API? I don't believe you. I think it's every single one of you. So uh, do you know the, the non-blocking extensions on Surflet 3.1? Have you used it? I see a few brave souls. <laughs> they probably still have nightmares. Um, so as an example, I want to explain to you, like, if you want to make a surflet that will simply re reply the same thing you send to it. So you request something, it will just mirror that. If I write blocking code, it's actually very straightforward. I open uh, an input stream, I, I read it, and every, uh, I read a little bit, and that little bit I write it again to the output stream, keep on going until I'm done. Very straightforward. Not difficult. but. This is the non-blocking version of it, and it works fine. I couldn't figure out how it worked, but it's, it's made by the authors of the extension, so, and it works, but it's really, really complicated. It really looks bad, and this is like the best case scenario. It's the simplest thing you could do in this case. So I will scale down a little bit, and, I, and the only thing I will do, I just read from a file system, just to have a bit more manageable amount of code. And, and what, they, what this does is that um, the, the magic thing here is that you add a write listener to the output stream. That will convert the output stream in a magical non-blocking output stream, which is uh, not really an output stream anymore, but that's another, another story. And whenever it's possible to write to that stream, it will send you this event in the callback on write possible. Then you have to check if it's ready if it's ready, if it says yes, you write one piece of data. And then you need to check again. And you keep on checking. And at some point, it will say, no, I'm not ready. Then you just return from this function, because you can't block. You can't block. You have to keep going, because we're doing non-blocking, right? So, and then it will, 
you will return from this method, and at some point, it will give you a new callback to unwrite possible if it has space again to take more writes. And so that's uh, actually a very uh, unintuitive thing, but it is as complicated as it is. You can't really simplify it much more. Bob is happy. Bob doesn't block anymore. The, the developers are, are not so happy because it's, because even if this is like the most simple, simple scenario that's possible, but it's, <laughs> it, it gets worse from here, right? <laughs> yeah, that was unnecessarily brutal, but still. So now I need to brace you, brace a little bit. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of Java conference, but this is the same code in Node.js. I'll let that sink in for a moment. Yeah, so you take the request, you say pipe, and you say the result. What comes in goes out. And that's so much easier way to look at it. And like Java developers will be like, <laughs> this is just wrong. But we, we talk about pipes. Talking about pipes is actually, in a nutshell, that's what reactive is. It's not really scientifically accurate, but if you describe what a pipe does, you don't talk about it. Well, that pipe takes a little bit of water from here and transport, then it takes a little bit more. No, it's a pipe. It just is there, right? And it's obvious what it does. And it doesn't take any initiative, but it responds to when water comes out of this side, it will transport to the other side. And that's a so much easier way to look at it. So. Reactive programming is actually programming pipes. So for that, there is a, a sort of project, Reactive X. It's a, it's a multilingual pro project that has a, a lot of different bindings. I'm, today, I'm going to talk only about RxJava, but there is also Scala, RxJS. There's even RxPHP. I don't know why, but it's. <laughs> I, I haven't tried it. I don't. I'm not going near it. So the most important part of uh, the our Java is the observable class. And if, if you have an observable, for example, a method returns an observable, it actually hands you one end of a pipe. And it says, at some point, stuff will come out of this pipe. So, uh, and then, it, so, and finally, it will say when it's done or when, it, when something went wrong. So, uh, whoops. Uh, so let, let's start with an example. Uh, uh, I will make an observable. I put in four strings, four cities in Africa, and I will subscribe to it. So that's like connecting the pipe. And that will spit out those four strings. And in the subscriber, lambda, I just print out every item. So this is pretty straightforward, right? Right? Yeah, OK, right. good. <laughs> so, but I can also do a range. Like I say, from 0 to 1,000, print it out. So you have a pipe, and one, zero comes out, one comes out, etc., until 1,000. I need to go through this quickly, but uh, I, I, I think you'll bear with me. You can also do operations like skip. I'm, I'm not interested in the first, first 10, but then I want the 10, and after 10, I'm not interested anymore. So then it will unsubscribe. And that means that actually, when you do this, this observable will only produce up until 20, because then the subscribe will say, then the take will say, I'm, I'm done. I don't need anything anymore. So it will say, unsubscribe to its parent. And then it will actually stop. So let's do something else. We have a file with, uh, with an XML file. We're going to read it. So if you're going to read a reactive file, it will say that you get a pipe. And from time to time, some bytes will come flying out of it. So what you do then, you can use an operator to parse those uh, uh, those bytes, and they will spit out from time to time XML events. Something started, something ended, et cetera. So what I do now, I, I return, uh, I, do, I insert this uh, operation, and then I have XML event, and I just print them out here. Yeah? Pretty straightforward. <laughs> You're still with me? OK, good. So we can do some other things. So for example, I, I, I read the file, I parse the file. Then I say, I'm only interested in start elements. Just filter and ignore the rest. Then I say, I don't want element. I just want the name attribute. And then I do the same thing. So then it will only return the names, right? So this is, uh, in a nutshell, how many uh, reactive programs 
work. So if we do this, we can actually use the reactive, uh, the, the non-blocking servlet API. We can actually make our Node.js style pipe. The code behind these two methods is uh, gruesome, but this is nice. So, um, reactive APIs, um, that's, uh, um, that's an interesting thing to think about. Let, let's, let's dive into that. So, for example, I have a, an API that will get the ter temperature in the city from some weather service. So, it will, uh, you put in a city, it will connect to the uh, internet, it will uh, parse it, get the content, and it will just return the value. Basic, right? So now we want to turn this into a reactive API. So the first thing we can do is make sure it will return an observable, the pipe. We don't really need to start doing everything, everything non-blocking. We can just wrap this into a, into a just statement and that will just, instead of returning the double, it will return a pipe with just single, one single entry. So, can you wrap non-blocking stuff into something non-blocking and then all of a sudden it's a non-blocking thing? No, it doesn't quite work, well, a little bit. Because what you can do now, uh, um, if I want to read this, I can just start by uh, connecting the pipe and just block until the first thing comes out. It's still blocking code, it's, it's not non-blocking yet. But the important part here is, is that now, the threading of the, the, the method itself and the threading of the consumer of the method are completely free from each other. Silence. Yeah, so that means that if I change the threading model of the provider, the consumer doesn't need to know, and vice versa. And that's actually quite a big deal because usually when we call methods, you kind of need to know how the threading works. And now we don't. So, if we have this situation, then we can, for example, um, use a non-blocking HTTP caller, like RxNetty. We'll do that, I'm not going to go into that, but that will just um, use a non-blocking first, so it won't block while getting the data from the web. If I still block as a consumer, there's still an unhappy Bob somewhere, so it's still blocking then, but we can do it independently. And uh, skip this one, not enough time. Uh, and at some point I can also change the, uh, the consumer, for example, if it's a, like an Android app, I can uh, schedule the, the result that whenever something arrives here, I can do some UI work, for example, something changed. And now there is no blocking anywhere and then you are in business. So you can do it gradually, and that's, I think, in today's time, is really important that you can do it one at a time. So, our Java is not all rainbows and unicorns. There's the concept of back pressure, and it's not particularly difficult, but you don't need it anywhere else. Well, generally, in blocking code, you don't really need it. So, what is back pressure? Suppose we have uh, an operator, some operation, there's a pipe of data coming in and there's a pipe of data coming out. The in one is big and the out one is small. So, uh, let's go. Oh, wait. Yeah, so if, if this operation would be a city and this would be a river, you would be in, in trouble pretty quickly, right? Because if more water's coming in than going out, at some point your feet will be wet. But what be, the idea of back pressure is, is that you can somehow communicate the fact that you can't handle it that fast to the source, right? So if you would replace that river by, by a pipeline, something that's closed, then it, you couldn't push it into the pipe as fast anymore, right? So essentially the pressure in the pipe communicates upstream that you have to slow down. Because that's actually quite a big deal because if you just, for example, start reading a file and shoving it into some observable really as quick as it will go, then, oh, sorry, 
then something's going to give, right? It can be a file of 10 gigabytes, and that will eat all your memory if it can't keep up. So um, memory consumption is also a bit of an uh, issue often with, uh, with non-blocking. If you get it right, it can be much, much better, because you only worry about the part you're working on now, and you can discard things much quicker. But if you get it wrong, it can be so much worse because then you can have a system that completely floods. Error handling is tricky because um, right now, if you take, for example, uh, um, the operator, like here, we are handling, uh, again, an XML file. But now, the XML is invalid because it, there's a tag missing. And that means that this will come out of your uh, your pipeline, so you have the, the bytes, and you have the, the parsed XML, and then you send it somewhere, for example. And then all of a sudden, it says parse error, but you can't really, say, throw an exception and undo the stuff you already done. So you have to think that when, once you do something, it hasn't even parsed the whole file yet. So there might be trouble down the road. So that's not something that's a, really a deal breaker, but it's something to take into consideration. More challenges. Um, one thing that uh, a misconception that people often have is that uh, non-blocking code is actually uh, a lot faster. And that is fundamentally not really true because it's about utilizing threads. And uh, if you have enough threads lying around doing nothing and that's fine, then it doesn't matter, right? So if you have a, have a system that will need five simultaneous connections and you have five threads, well, if you make it non-blocking, then you'll have five mostly idle threads, but that's about it. So it won't make the round trips uh, necessarily faster. Okay, so um, another, an, another aspect is that it requires changing your way of thinking. Because it's, it's, it's not that, uh, it's, it's easy to start, but at some point, if you have been doing imperative programming for a long time, you have to change your thinking. And that's, especially if you want some team members to join you in that thinking, and they don't really want to, <laughs> you'll, you'll meet with resistance, yeah? Uh, and you also meet resistance from your own brain, because if you have been doing something imperatively a long time, you'll still always go back to that, and that's, uh, that will take some, some, uh, some work. Another thing is, is that right now, there aren't all that many reactive interfaces. So, for example, if you want to connect to something remote, then you need something that will talk with you in that kind of way. So there are very few reactive interfaces available. So for example, if you look at uh, MongoDB has a reactive driver, CouchDB has one, but uh, uh, RxNetty does a nice TCP and HTTP one. But, uh, uh, yeah, I got there, those. But, but for example, SQL is a whole lot harder if you have a non-blocking drive, because like something like JDBC, which is everywhere, is fundamentally a blocking thing. So uh, there are some, some uh, attempts for this. I think there's one for MySQL, but it's, uh, yeah, it, it's very far from standard. And there are some, uh, some, some reactive XML parsers, JSON parsers. There are some things that you can plug in between. And if, it, if you have that, it's really easy to work with. But if, if you have to make a reactive uh, interface on top of it first, that's a lot of work. Yeah. So. Um, some more thoughts. Uh, I think one very important part of RxJava is that it's just a jar file. It has no dependencies on itself, so you can just add it as a dependency and just start playing it around in one corner of one project. And if it's different than something like, like Akka or something that's a much more uh, invasive change, that's something you really don't take lightly to 
the usual framework, but this is just a jar, and if you need to explain it to a manager or something, you say, it's just a jar, it's just like some logging framework or whatever. You, you can just put it in and then nobody will ever know until they see your code, then it's pretty obvious. But, but it, it does make it a lot easier because, and, then, and you can just try, and if you hate that part, well, you, then you, then you uh, remove it again. It's not like you have to do a lot of work until you even know if it works or not. Um, easy to add. I do really do like the programming model. Uh, it's not for everything, but you don't really need to do it for everything, right? So, also, I, I don't, I, I would not advocate to take an entire huge application and make everything reactive. Once you get this, it, it kind of feels like it. Yeah, make everything reactive. And if you feel that, it's usually a bad idea. <laughs> so, so uh, you can just focus on the parts where it hurts. If it's really, if you're losing a lot of threads because there is something waiting at some point, thank you, I'll be short. Uh, uh, yeah, so if there's a specific point in your application where there is an issue with, with, with where blocking code causes a problem, you just attack that issue. And there might be a lot of places where it's no problem whatsoever and you leave just those alone, right? So, and for me, I'm, I've, I, I have been into non-blocking for a while, but this is the first time it is kind of bearable, at least. Yeah, so it's, it's not as bad as it was. And as I said, it can be used incrementally. So, uh, one final thought I want to give you is that, uh, Blocking I.O. doesn't really exist, in a way. I mean, it is not one thing you do. You s it is at least two. It, it, it's at least that you start, you initiate the connection, you send the message, and the second thing is that you wait for the result. It's two things. And I think that's an important thing to realize, that if you... Uh, if you treat it like a method call, it's not true. It is not a method call. It's not something your thread is going into and doing. It's not doing anything. It's, it's, a, it's a simplification that works up to a point, but it's, it's not right. And uh, I think it's, it's, it's good to think about, for example, uh, the enterprise Java bean age, where it, in the like in the early 2000s, then it, we thought it was a good idea to abstract network away. Like you make some kind of interface and it pretends to be local, but it's not. And that turned out not to be the greatest idea. It's, it, it's nice not to have to worry about it, but reality has a way of getting back to you. It is a network call, it is different. And especially if we talk, think about that, that, um, that, that if you have a lot of blocking code, you might block more than one thread if you think about it, because something else might be calling what you are waiting for, and something else might be calling that. So you can end up with situations where there is just one point that's blocking uh, like 10 threads or 20 threads. And in modern applications nowadays, you can see situations where 90% of the threads are waiting for something else to happen, probably each other, right? So, so that, that wastes a whole lot of money. And even though nowadays, uh, like Amazon is cheap, but we, they make a good money. So uh, there is money to be saved by, by, by using less. So, but treating blocking I.O. as a single method call, you can sometimes get away with it if your network latency is low. So the, 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 comp the components of your software project are nearby, not on Mars, and if it's reliable. And both of these um, things are kind of crumbling because network latency is low, that is technically, you could, you could argue that it's true, but uh, we spread around our applications more and more. We make uh, 
while we used to build monolith where that's not really a problem, now we build at least on multi-hosts. But if we are really kind of avant-garde, we make a multi-data center. And the data covers so much more different distance. And then as the processors get faster, but the latency does not, you do feel that la la latency is actually feels higher than it used to be. Uh, so yeah, multi-host, we, can, uh, we can't do without, and we also cr cross data center. Reliable networks, like if I think back of the late 90s, were networks much less reliable then? No, really, uh, because we use wireless now. And wireless is so much more fundamentally unreliable. Anything can happen. There might be something interfering with it, and you have no way of preventing or predicting that. And there are all kinds of protocols to fix that and to move on, but uh, it does mean that wireless performance is really much less predictable than wired performance. And that means, for example, if you think about it, if you have a service that will have a servlet, for example, listening, and there's a mobile device somewhere in the country in, on a bad connection, and it will connect to your servlet and will try to make a connection, it's completely normal that a connection just freezes for a few seconds. As a mobile user, you're used to that, that, that sometimes happens. But for the server, that means that it will take up an entire thread for all that time. And threads are expensive. So uh, the more and more wireless we go, and the more and more mobile we go, this, this gets shakier and shakier. So if I put those things together, um, I say threads are expensive. There, there is, uh, if you have a, a big host with, it can handle hundreds of threads, maybe thousands, but not millions. It, it doesn't keep on scaling. So threads are big things, actually. So uh, you could argue that you just have, a lot, have to have a lot of threads, but that does not seem to scale as well. Um, and the speed of light is a bit of a hard limit, right? So uh, that's not going to budge because we really want it to. So uh, everything keeps get, getting faster except that. The microservices, we sp keep spreading around all our, our components much, much more. And I think also an important one to, to take into consideration that if you have a blocking system and it is busy and it's not happy and it's getting overloaded, it misbehaves because it means that if it's slow, it needs more threads to do the same amount of work because it's just hanging around. If it needs more threads, it needs more memory. If it needs more memory, it needs more garbage collection. And then it moves slower again, and then it needs more threads. And generally, under high load, blocking systems can die a horrible death. And non-blocking systems are more re resilient to that because they are better at just doing as, going as fast as they can and not faster. Right? So they just keep on going, and sometime, at some point you need to drop things or something. It's not a magic, but it won't just die. Um, so that will mean that the price of using broken locking communication will keep going up. That's my prediction. So if I put that together, I think non-blocking code will be inevitable at some point. We will, at some point, we need to face that we can't keep pretending that everything is local. And I think we better get ready for that because I think it will be even a problem a lot quicker than we need to worry about pizzas on Mars. So that's all I got. Thank you very much. Pretty impressive. Just a minute to bring the microphone for the question. Uh, as you said, uh, uh, non-blocking code is a way of thinking. Yeah. So I would like to ask, because testing uh, had became also a way of thinking or part of our way of thinking uh, in programming, mm -hmm. how does it affect testing? I mean, uh, does it? Because, okay, in unit tests it doesn't, but in functional tests 
Now uh, it changes the perception. Not as much as you might think. I mean, there is still, um, it, it will influ influence how you wire things up. But especially what I mentioned before, that, that it, it kind of insulates the threading models. That means that you can very easily test multi-threaded things by mocking up in a different way. And that makes it actually unit tests work pretty well in, uh, in, uh, in reactive mode. Yes, but, but what about uh, uh, integration of functional tests, I mean, uh, which you must test all the way to the multiple components of the application, like uh, databases? Well, I mean, if, you, if, if I'm talking about it this way, like the, if I connect to a database, it's still the same database. So it's not the database itself. I'm, talking, I'm just talking about how you manage the streams, right? And functionally, they should behave the same. With, with the exception, what I um, noted with the error messages, is that you need to be really sure when you catch an error because the reactive model really is into flowing things through and keep on going, but sometimes you don't want to keep on going if there's a problem. So I, I think that takes, that takes a bit more uh, thinking as well, but that's more error handling than testing. Okay. So I'm guessing there are a lot of folks in the audience who might be thinking about adopting this in their services, products, whatever. But with the cost, of, there's a cost in absorbing new technologies as they come, right? So from your perspective, how reliable is RxJava? Not from the point of view of the users who might use and abuse it, but from the point of view of the library itself. I, I think the, the, the library is pretty solid there. I mean, it has been around for quite a while, actually. It, it, it has gotten more mainstream recently, but it, it has gone through uh, quite a bit of iterations. And J our Java is not the only shop in town. Like uh, Akka does some, there's uh, the Spring also has a reactive uh, component there. So I, I think the most, um, the biggest risk now is that you do something that makes sense in the blocking world and that's a really bad idea in reactive. But I have not, I don't have any reason to think that uh, RxJava is an unreliable component. In other words, every time it failed, it was my fault. <laughs> any further questions? Hi, uh, would you consider maintaining consistent state in systems with observables a big challenge comparing to imperative programming? So you mean reactive state inside reactive streams? Yeah, so if a stream dies, what happens? Well, in a way you could look at it like a system like Kafka, which is also a kind of a stream consistent, uh, not persistent stream, so it will save it up, and that kind of adds in nicely to this, because yeah, if, it's, if it fails, it's gone. So um, if you want to go to the Kafka-like integration systems, then it works really nice. So if you want more persistence, then you need something like that. Hi. Uh, how does it uh, interfere with, with uh, completables of Java 8, the Arc Java? Which is, what is uh, its relation to it? Uh, so if, you, if you're using something older than Java 8, it works. It's from Java 7 on, but you can't use lambdas. And you do miss them there. Because there's a lot of uh, places like all the subscribe functions. I, in the examples, I made them as a, as a lambda. And if you have to make like the whole ugly interfacey things that is more boilerplate, but it works fine. Anybody else? Are we fine? Yes, we are. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next session with Nicholas Frankel will start in a few minutes. <laughs>